How is it even possible to convey the spirituality, the idioms, and the culture of the Hebrews when scripture is translated from Hebrew into Greek, and then into Latin, then into German, and then into English? Welcome to Revealing the Truth. I'm John Fisher and with me is David Brett. We want to talk today about the difficulties encountered when we translate something from one language into another and the even greater difficulty when it's multiplied in its translations. That's why uh, I opened up and, and asked, is it even possible to convey the spirituality, the, the idiomatic expressions and the culture of one uh, group of people into another language and can con convey all of that. It, it's, it seems impossible. Especially when one language, is, language was essentially lost, the Hebrew language, but it was, it was brought back to life, essentially, mm -hmm. right. as was the land of Israel. Right, mm -hmm. and Latin uh, was, was a language, but it is extinct, basically, except in certain churches when they still use uh, the Latin expression. Mm -hmm. Consider translating Shakespeare's M Macbeth into the language of Hmong, um, a, a language of the hill people of Vietnam. And imagine trying to maintain the, the idiomatic expressions, the culture, and the spirituality of Elizabethan royalty. <laughs> it, it would seem to be uh, impossible to do that. Mm -hmm. And, and such we see in the parent, and, and actually it's, it's very clear, uh, difficulty in reading uh, English that's been translated from uh, German, from Latin, from Greek, uh, of, of the Hebrew. And so, um, because uh, Hebrew is a Semitic, uh, Babylonian, Middle Eastern, um, peoples, including Israel, and um, and the people of England are, are Celtic, French, Scandinavian, Breton peoples uh, of England. It's they're, they're two different cultures. Let's call them the East and the West, uh, or the Hebrews and the Greeks. Um, Hebrews think in terms of function, functionality and Greeks think in the terms of form. So it's a, it's a difference between form and function. Uh, if you ask a Hebrew to describe a pencil, uh, he would say you simply write with it, whereas the Greek would say, well, it's about this long, it's colored yellow, it has a rubber tip on the end for it. it would, he would describe the form of it, whereas the Hebrew would look at the functioning of it. Um, the scripture is written in functional circular patterns. And when we try to understand the law, the covenants, uh, the prophecies, the idioms, and the culture of the Israelites through Greek eyes, we fail to see what is written in black and white. To the Greek mind, the Bible looks like a storybook. Um, an event happens, then we move on to the next event, um, like the progressions in a movie. There's a beginning, a middle, and an end. And we don't go back to the beginning at the end of the story. The story is finished, it's over, it's done. To the Hebrew mind, though, the Bible is one story repeated over and over again, but in, a different, but in different contexts. Every story has the same character roles. Um, the lawgiver, the father, the son, the family, uh, plot of land, the covenant, the promise, the betrayal, the punishment, uh, the repentance, the forgiveness, and the reconciliation. Each retelling of the story reiterates to us how to function in our own lives using the Bible as a reference. Western grammar um, 
or we might say Greek thinking, has three tenses, the past, the present, and the future. Uh, and this frame of reference seems to allow people to exist in any of the three, of course, in our minds. And uh, when we're talking about helping someone um, recover from trauma in the past, and someone who is always focused in the future, living in the future or living in the past, of course, they're not living in the present. So when, when people go to therapy, they're basically <laughs> taught how to live in the present. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the danger of having three tenses um, in, I, in Western thinking. I imagine for someone in that situation that they would have a hard time functioning in society if they're thinking in the future or thinking in the, in the past. Right. Yeah. If we're thinking of form, um, and, and that form is past, present, and future, if, if that's where we live, then we're not able to really take control of the here and the now. Mm -hmm. um, it affects our communication and our ability to form relationships in this life if we're living in the past. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of that is not just conscious stuff, it's unconscious. And of course, therapy is the, <laughs> is the process of trying to understand our past and, and to reshape those errors in thinking that, that we've been given in our childhood. Mm -hmm. And in Eastern grammar, there are not three tenses. There's only two tenses. And uh, the first one is that which has been accomplished. And the second tense is that which is yet to be accomplished. Mm -hmm. So th the idea of going back into the past when something's already done it just doesn't exist. Um, and the, <clears throat> the other tense, uh, that which has not been accomplished, implies that there's a goal. There's something that needs to be accomplished. It's function, not form. It's what do I need to do now? And so when we're reading the scripture in, in terms of past, present, and future, we come up with all these linear lines. You know, this happened, and then that was done away with, and this happened, and then that was done away with. This is where we get from the Greek uh, and Latin thinking, basically it's Greek, Western thinking, is that the Messiah came to do away with the law, because that is done and finished. It's, it's, <laughs> that's, um, we remember that that's the way it used to be, but now is different. And so um, we have this idea of replacement theology, that the church has replaced Israel. Mm -hmm. When if you read the scripture for what it says, it is clear that Israel is not lost. In fact, the Messiah came to restore all Israel, all 12 tribes. Um, who did he send his disciples to in the book of uh, Matthew uh, in chapter 10? Mm -hmm. he, he took his 12 disciples, and they're named in the verse before this, but he sends them uh, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Those are the 10 tribes um, that Peter wrote to when he wrote to the pilgrims of the uh, dispersion, that uh, James wrote to when he wrote to the 12 tribes, and who John wrote to in the book of Revelation. He wrote yeah. to the seven assemblies. All of these peoples that Peter, James, and John are writing to are in the land that was owned by Assyria, the nation that came in and, and you know, scattered them to the world. Yeah, actually, I'm using a bookmark, which is one of our many studies. It's called The Hope of Israel. And it gets into more detail about who Israel is and, and why we should be aware of that because uh, a lot of people have forgotten the idea that uh, there were northern tribes, that there, there were other tribes besides Judah. Mm -hmm. Of course, Judah, the Jews are recognizable and they're referred to as Israel. And in a sense, that's true, but it's not the whole truth. And what we're trying to do here is present the whole, not just in part. You right. Know. Well, you can imagine that if, if any preacher in Christianity were to say anything that would imply that Israel still exists as an entity, as the, the, the treasure of Yahweh, then you'd have to do away with, with Christian theology that the church has replaced Israel. Mm -hmm. And that's why you don't hear about the, the, the 10 tribes and how Yahshua sent his disciples uh, to the 10 tribes uh, to bring them back. He also re reiterates that he's only come for the house of Israel in chapter 15. Of, of Matthew. Mm -hmm. and, and of course the Israelites have a, a different way of thinking, the, that Hebrew uh, thinking process. And when we look at scriptures, and it took me a while to, to understand this, but like in Matthew 6 and verses uh, 22, 23, it talks about the relation of, of uh, 
money, but it, it also brings up these ideas that, you know, if your eye is clear, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. Well, it turns out that the good eye in Hebrew essentially means being generous, and that the bad eye in Hebrew basically means stingy. So we, we understand some of the, the Hebrew um, um, ways of, of communicating, uh, we're, we're seeing that even in our translations in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. And understanding this uh, might allow us to accept that there are errors in Scripture. And some of them are innocent errors uh, because there's just a lack of understanding uh, in the Greek mind to understand what the Hebrew mind is saying. But there are other places where we know for sure that the Scripture is uh, or the, the translators have taken advantage of the fact that people reading it in Greek or in Latin or in German or English don't understand what the Hebrew is saying and they're translating it from their own frame of reference um, and, and as a result there are errors. Um, and sometimes that frame of reference is actually a biased reference. Well, that's what I'm saying, yeah. right. Sometimes it's biased in order to promote a certain doctrine, uh, which we're going to talk about uh, as we go through this episode. Um, the, one of those doctrines is the Trinitarian doctrine, which we talked about in uh, the last time, uh, which was a contrivance uh, manufactured by a Roman Empire, emperor, I should say, um, to blend pagan doctrines into a belief, a strong belief that was growing rapidly in the Messiah of Israel. So he combined uh, the, the celebrations of paganity with the belief in the Messiah and come up with uh, Christmas as the day of the Messiah's birth and Easter as a celebration. But these are not in scripture, uh, except when it's pointing to you know, pagan celebrations. And of course, Yahweh says, don't even think of asking the nation surrounding you, speaking to Israel, about how they uh, worship their deities. Mm -hmm. uh, for him, it's an abomination. And of course, I mean, that's why <laughs> we have this uh, dispensationalism where Israel has been done away with and that, uh, that Joshua came to, dis to destroy the law. I mean, he says clearly that he has not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. And of course, uh, Christian uh, doctrine teaches that that word fulfill there means has put them to end, but it does not. It means to validate. Later on in the, in the next few verses, it talks about, Yahshua says that not one jot or tittle will be taken from the law until all has been fulfilled. And that word is a completely different word than the other word fulfill. That word does mean end, but the first one means validate. So. He did not come to destroy the law, but to build it up. Mm -hmm. That's the opposite. So, and all we have to do is look at it and see <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying. But, um, and that gets into prophecy of Yahweh prophesying that he's going to magnify the law, lift it up, and that's exactly what his son did. And, and mm -hmm. isn't that proper for a son to honor his father? Mm -hmm. And I, I was glancing down here, Matthew 7, 21, it says, not everyone who says to me, master, master, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father, right. who is in heaven, will enter. Exactly. Yeah. And we want to con continue this discussion uh, when you come back. Did you know the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, the original language? Yes, I did. What about the New Testament? Was it originally written in Greek, or was it translated from Hebrew? And why were the revealed Hebrew names of Yahweh our Heavenly Father and Yahshua, His Son the Messiah, left out of the New Testament? Those are great questions. Learn the biblical truth. Request our free pamphlet, Was the New Testament Originally Greek? You can receive our free pamphlet by visiting us online at www.yaiy.org or by writing to YAIY 2963 County Road 233, Kingdom City, Missouri 65262 and call us toll free at 1-877-642-4101.
want to be clear that we renounce the idea <clears throat> that the Holy Spirit is a personage, or the Holy Ghost, as we see written in the New Testament of the King James Version. Uh, we believe that um, the term Holy Ghost was conceived um, to give this idea that it was a personage. But of course, the Holy Ghost is the Holy Spirit, as we read in the New King James Version, because it's the same word. It's, it, in Greek, it's pneuma. And uh, anytime you read the word ghost and read the word spirit, uh, when speaking of the Holy Spirit, we are actually referencing the spirit of Yahweh. Mm -hmm. Okay, now Yahshua has said that no one has seen the Father. So who was speaking to, <laughs> to Moses? Who was speaking to Noah? Who, uh, who was speaking to Adam and Eve? It was Messiah. And, and interestingly, this is consistent with most doctrines in, in the Christian church, that it was uh, the Messiah who created the universe. It was. It's true. He was the, the craftsman, mm -hmm. the master craftsman. But he was doing it under the authority of Yahweh, who is pure spirit. And Yahweh is, is uh, the holy of holies. He is the holiest of, of all, of, of everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even the Messiah said, why do you call me good? And there's only one good, right. that's the Father. Right, mm -hmm. and, you know, plus uh, it's only Yahweh who knows when his day is, is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Yahshua doesn't know. Well, he might know now. But at that yeah. time, certainly, <laughs> no one knew at that time, not right. even himself, and he, he recognized that. Yeah. Right, and so it's clear that there's a father and the son, and there's a reason for that, which I hope that we can talk about here um, as, as we go on through this. But <clears throat> I want to say that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Yahweh. Anytime you read the Holy Spirit, you're speaking of the Spirit of Yahweh. Well, what is Spirit? The spirit is, is also, the, the word there in Hebrew, uh, the, the ruach, hmm. is also used to convey the idea of wind right. or and, a breath. And the wind, the wind comes and goes, and, and you don't see it, but you, you, you see the effects of it. Right. So Yahweh's spirit affects certain things right. and, and affects us, right. and helps the, us. And the wind and the breath of Yahweh are not persons. Okay? They, it, it's an entity. It's the character. Hmm. It's the strength, it's the glory, it's the, the wisdom, the power mm -hmm. of Yahweh. That is what is given. It's not a person. A person right. doesn't fall on someone. It's not poured out. And, right. You know. there, there's no need for another, for a ghost, for a spirit other than Yahweh. He is spirit, mm -hmm. and he is the Holy Spirit. Well, that is part of the Hebrew language. I mean, I think the Apostle Paul said he was ready to be poured out like a, a drink offering. So, you know, the language can be used, but it's, it's like us saying it's raining cats and dogs, but if we go to New Guinea and tell someone that, they're going to go, huh? All right. You know, right. most likely. Well, that's the idiomatic um, differences that are hard to translate. Uh, not impossible. Sure. But, but it's difficult, especially when we don't understand where the, the, uh, uh, the original writings or thoughts are, are coming yeah. from. When Yahweh imbues a person with his spirit, he is giving the character of himself, of Yahweh, um, to that person. So that, and what is the purpose of that? When we're given the spirit, the character, the wisdom of Yahweh, what is he wanting from us? To do his will. Mm -hmm. it's, it's the strength, it's the power and the wisdom to obey our Heavenly Father. That's why he's giving to us. That's why he gave his spirit to Yahshua uh, after he was baptized, so that he could accomplish his, his mission. The spirit was given to uh, people in the Old Testament. It was given to David, it was given to um, Shaul, um, it was given uh, to Noah, given mm -hmm. to Moses. Uh, I mean, the, Yahweh gives his spirit, he gives his character and yeah. his strength to Sha people. Shaul, like King Saul, right. essentially, yeah. And King David, of course, had the spirit, it stayed with him, but King Saul lost the spirit. And so we, we see that as uh, uh, something to consider today, that we c could actually lose the spirit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I want to read uh, uh, some verses from Scripture. I want to read it from the King James Version, and then the same verses in the King... Uh, the New King James Version. And the only thing that I've changed here are the names to protect mm -hmm. the innocent. <laughs> um, 
so uh, in Matthew 3, verses uh, 11 through 16, here's the King James Version. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance. This is John speaking. But he that cometh after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he will burn up the chaff and unqu with unquenchable fire. Then cometh Yahshua from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and thou comest to me? And Yahshua answered and said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and Yahshua, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now, that same passage in the, King James, the New King James Version reads as follows. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. His, winning, his winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn. By the way, when we see this pronoun, his, we're not talking about um, the Holy Ghost or the Spirit. We're talking about Yahshua, who is imbued with the Spirit of, of Yahweh. Um, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Yahshua came from Galilee to John in the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you are coming to me. But Yahshua answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he allowed him. When he had been baptized, Yahshua came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of Yahweh descending like a dove and alighting upon him. Now, when we see this um, image of a dove, he's not actually describing a physical entity. He's, it, this is a metaphor that is falling, it's, it's alighting, it's landing upon him. The spirit of Yahweh has overcome him. And um, Yahweh's spirit, his character, his power and strength and honor and glory have fallen upon the Messiah. Mm -hmm. There seems to be some confusion about the, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Well, the fire, of course, John the Baptist is speaking of a future judgment mm -hmm. and uh, where the, the chaff will be um, burned up with unquenchable fire. Right. Well, if you notice, I, I left those two words out, or and with fire, because it doesn't appear in the Greek. Oh, really? There, right? Oh, interesting. So. Another place where we find that scripture has been added to. There are, there are 12 verses in the New Testament that testify that the Holy Spirit is in fact the spirit of Yahweh. Uh, for he is the epitome of holiness and he is pure spirit. As Joshua testified that no one has seen the Father except him. Yahweh is the spirit of holiness. Um, is he not? Is, is Yahweh not the spirit of holiness, the spirit of righteousness? Therefore, he is the Holy Spirit. And when I, when I read a, a few of the following verses, uh, as they are written, uh, except with the name Yahweh restored, in your mind, think Holy Spirit when you hear the words, the spirit of Yahweh. Let's try this out. Matthew 12, 28. But if I cast out demons by the spirit of Yahweh, that's the, 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 the literal uh, reading here, uh, or if I were to read it um, uh, as I'm asking you to do it, it would be, but if I cast out demons by the Holy Spirit, surely the kingdom of Yahweh has come upon you. Does that make sense? Is that, are those equal terms, would you say? Another one, Romans 8, 9. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of Yahweh, if indeed the Holy Spirit dwells in you. See any difference there? It goes on, now if anyone does not have the spirit of Messiah, he is not his. Yahshua Messiah received the spirit of Yahweh at his baptism. Um, therefore, he carries with him the Holy Spirit. 
the Spirit of Yahweh. Uh, in Romans 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of Yahweh, as many of you who are led by the Holy Spirit, so that from Jerusalem um, and, and round about to Illyricum, um, Illyricum, I have fully preached the evangel of Messiah. Uh, here they are, those two terms combined, in Ephesians 4.30. Uh, and do not grieve the Holy Spirit of Yahweh, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And when is that? Is that the day we're baptized? Or is it the day that Yahshua returns? Yahshua returns. Because his, mm -hmm. his death, his sacrifice, his propitiation for our sins, does um, justify us for entrance into the kingdom. But it's like you have this ticket that you can use <laughs> when the Messiah comes back. But if you lose the ticket, or if you destroy the ticket, or throw it away, then that justification doesn't hold true. Mm -hmm. um, it's a seal, but it's not like a tattoo. It can be removed. Right. Well, I guess actually tattoos can be removed. <laughs> yeah, Bad not analogy. without a lot of pain, but you know. True, yeah. But it, the, 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 the analogy for me works mm -hmm. because um, being, um, it's just saying that you believe in Messiah does justify you, but it doesn't put you into the kingdom. What puts us into the kingdom is when Yahshua comes back and he redeems good fruit. He's paid for the fruit. Mm -hmm. He's paid his, the price for our redemption. It's when he comes back that he's going to redeem us. So I ask you, have you been saved? If you believe in Messiah, you have been saved. But if I ask you, have you been redeemed? Not yet. Mm -hmm. No one has been redeemed yet. You know, it's anyway. like the idea of being born again. I mean, we're, we're, yeah. we're not born from above just yet. Well, I think that there, there is a connection. Uh, if we have the Holy Spirit within us, if, if we've been baptized in the name of Yahshua and have our hands laid upon us, to granting the, the promise of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, then, um, yeah, uh, we, a new our destination is the kingdom, mm -hmm. okay? But we can throw it away. We can, we can hold our hand up against Yahweh and testify to others that, that it's not true, that the scripture is not to be obeyed. And thus we, we lose our redemption. We can be saved, but we need to be redeemed. And so it's our prayer that you would search out the scripture and come to an understanding, study it at its depth in the Hebrew and the Greek to understand what the scripture is really saying. Study the Hebrews and their culture and their idioms uh, for the truth. May Yahweh bless you.